Selamat siang. I, uh, I would like to thank the Prasetya Mulia Global Scholar Network for inviting me uh, to speak before this uh, distinguished uh, gathering and to be part of a very distinguished panel. However, I will not be speaking today as a scholar, but as an administrator, an executive, if you will, one with uh, almost uh, 40 years experience in directing the MBA, EMBA, and executive education programs of one of the pioneer business schools in Asia. Uh, I will try and keep this talk short. I, uh, uh, I know you're all very eager to get to the uh, open forums. I am very eager to get to the Ekavarke Chil. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Wong has the advantage, you see. He, <laughs> he could skip. The, uh, <laughs> The uh, theme of our conference asserts the importance of innovation and entrepreneurship for sustainable growth in emerging economies. Now, as it happens, the uh, mission of the Asian Institute of Management to make a difference in promoting the sustainable development of Asian societies by developing professional, entrepreneurial, and socially responsible leaders and managers resonates very strongly with this theme. So today, I'd like to talk about the challenges that the Asian Institute of Management and, I dare say, other Asian business schools, like our host, the Prasetya Mulya Business School, must face if they are to produce the innovative and entrepreneurial talent that will drive sustainable economic growth in the emerging economies. Not only for businesses, but also for business schools. There exists today what I would call the innovation imperative. Now, I will talk about how AIM is confronting these challenges, hopefully through innovation and to some extent entrepreneurship. In recent years, business school deans and academics have written about the many global issues facing management education. I will mention just a few. The markets for management education are fragmenting, demanding greater focus and customization of curricula and programs. These markets, be they individual MBA aspirants looking to jumpstart or switch careers, companies looking to develop their managerial talent pool, or industries concerned about rapid growth outpacing their human resource capabilities, are all insisting upon, if not demanding, appropriate, efficient, and effective learning methodologies, materials, instructors, schedules, timetables, and venues. In Dubai, for example, white-collar Filipino employees have been asking AIM to design a part-time MBA program to be conducted in the Middle East. A maritime organization wants AIM to design an EMBA program for ships captains and ships and chief engineers, and they want the program delivered by satellite to ships at sea. An international audit firm is asking AIM to cut its 11-month master in management program down to less than five months, and those five months to be scheduled outside of the tax season. An association of BPOs and KPOs urgently needs an industry-specific master's program for IT-dependent outsourcing firms. Addressing these diversified needs tends to drive costs upwards. Highly customized programs for so-called niche markets make it difficult for a small school like AIM to achieve economies of scale. Customization requires costly R&D. As we are a case method school, we find ourselves having to write new cases from scratch and these cases will get fairly limited use. We would need to recruit instructors with the appropriate expertise and experience. Such recruitment of so-called professionally qualified or what the AACSB calls PQ instructors then creates problems, of course, with the AACSB, our accreditation body, which imposes a cap on the number of such instructors we can use in a degree program. 
and sometimes, of course, hiring instructors uh, with significant industry experience also creates problems with our own internal compensation uh, structures. Another global issue facing business schools in countries like the Philippines is the invasion of well-known schools from advanced countries. As these schools strike partnerships with local schools and even establish their own local campuses, we find ourselves making ever larger investments in faculty development, research, facilities, and so on, just to keep up. Nowadays, we even have to compete with schools that don't need campuses outside their own countries or to send their instructors overseas through MOOCs, the uh, massive uh, open online courses and other online programs, students in the developing economies can experience the kind of teaching and research in schools like MIT and Harvard and compare these directly with the local schools. One of the most popular and much admired online platforms today, the Khan Academy, is not even part of any school. Indeed, students from the emerging economies can stay at home and forego the high cost of travel and living abroad. They can even forego the relatively high cost of a top school in their own countries. Now, AIM has to compete with the best schools to attract the best students. To maintain the desired diversity in our classrooms, we need scholarships to attract the best candidates from other countries, especially the emerging economies. Last month, we lost several good candidates to our MBA program. We lost them to Hong Kong UST and INSEAD because we could not match their very hefty scholarship offers. Competition comes not only from educational institutions, but also from resource-rich corporations and consulting firms that have diversified into the training industry. Employees in companies that hire such firms to conduct their in-house executive education are finding that they don't really need an MBA in order to advance their careers. And some local companies have gotten so profitable anyway that they can now afford to send their executives for training in the name brand schools abroad. All these factors affect enrollment, which impacts revenues, which then puts cost pressures on precisely those factors that define a school's competitiveness, namely research, reputable faculty, marketing, modern facilities, and so on. It's becoming more expensive to compete, especially when, like AIM, one is competing internationally. One key factor that enhances or diminishes a school's competitiveness is its reputation. And the benchmarks for reputation, arguably, are international accreditation by bodies like the AACSP and the EFMD, and international rankings like the Financial Times and The Economist. Achieving and then maintaining these accreditations and rankings are extremely costly undertakings for schools in the emerging economies. With these competitive pressures more than ever, business schools must innovate in order to survive. I would like to elaborate on just two factors that have created a significant pressure on the Asian Institute of Management to innovate. The first is technology and its handmaiden, the internet. The second is international accreditation and rankings. Last week, a friend of mine shared by email, naturally, some funny pictures. I particularly enjoyed one that showed a sign posted by a teacher in his classroom, and it reads, Dear students, I know when you're texting in class. Seriously, no one just looks down at their crotch and smiles. Sincerely, your teacher. I see some people there looking and smiling at their crotches. Technology has infiltrated the classroom not only through mobile phones, but LCD projectors, Wi-Fi, internet, laptops, and tablets. Technology has consigned many artifacts of <laughs> my generation to obsolescence or oblivion. The LCD projector first replaced the overhead projector, but it's also displacing the blackboard and the flip chart 
because both instructors and students are increasingly using the LCG projector in conjunction with a tablet or laptop, wirelessly of course, in the classroom. Wi-Fi, Internet and Google or Wikipedia are making libraries obsolete. Researchers use online databases like EBSCO and ProQuest. Students only use our library now when they need a quiet place to catch up on their email. And the smartphone has replaced the grip sheet. You know, those little pieces of paper where students write down these mathematical formulas or other things they need to remember that when they take a test or an exam. Yes, students do cheat. And like the hackers who electronically steal billions of dollars from private bank accounts, they have grown increasingly sophisticated. But the mobile phone has constructive uses in the classroom too. I've seen one of my colleagues letting his students tweet their comments and reactions to a case discussion. And these tweets are projected to a screen on one side of the classroom. Now I might add that this is a particularly innovative way of using appropriate technology to enhance student engagement. And the smartphone has replaced the traditional notebook, you know, the kind, the paper kind. Students don't take notes anymore, they take a photo or Instagram of what's written on the blackboard or projected on the screen. Teachers must be current on their subject matter because even while they are delivering, for example, a lecture, their students are googling the topic or searching Wikipedia to see if their teacher has done his homework. My colleagues in the United States tell me that their students demand advanced copies of their PowerPoint lectures be mailed to them by email. And once they have the soft copies, they begin to think they don't maybe need to attend the classes anymore. <laughs> now, in a case method school like AIM, while the teacher and the class are discussing a case, for example, the Toyota Recall, students are searching the internet on what Toyota has actually done since then and whether the decisions taken by top management were the right ones or not. So now students are beginning to wonder why should, why should they bother attending some classes when they can get the same and often more complete information at their leisure from internet sources. Our teachers now face a lot of pressure to keep our students engaged. Not only is our credibility at issue, but our students coming from the video game generation <coughs> also expect entertainment value. Because even while they sit in class, they are reading their Gmail, Facebook, they're checking up on the latest football uh, results, they're reading up on the current love life of their favorite uh, K-pop stars, uh, and so on. Now, PowerPoints must have, those of us who use PowerPoints in the classroom, we must have multimedia and animation. And uh, at AIN, even our cases have gone multimedia, and some have even been written in manga comic book style. Some have created, some of our instructors have created Facebook pages for their courses and this becomes the primary non-classroom interface between teacher and uh, student. We also use uh, learning management systems like Moodle and, uh, and some of us uh, have used this. It is not inconceivable for a student to one day conclude that classroom time is a waste of time and he can get the same education over the internet. By now, many young and not so young people all over the world have discovered MOOCs and other online programs. And much of these are offered for free. So now the challenge is not only to keep the student engaged, but also to convince him of the value addition of a teacher, indeed of a traditional campus-based school and face-to-face -face classes. In fact, some students of late have begun to question the value of a degree conferred by a school that uses the traditional classroom-based, face-to-face pedagogy. I was in uh, Singapore uh, just uh, two days ago, and uh, uh, Prime Minister Li Shen Liung was citing several successful Singaporeans who uh, achieved their success without the benefit of a university degree. I don't know if he's trying to put some ideas there to challenge the universities in Singapore. 
Most people, they look at a business school as a professional school, one that prepares its students for a career as a professional manager. Consequently, employers expect that the school's diploma is an assurance that, that the student actually learned what the school was teaching. In actual fact, a diploma is not a warranty against defects. It's not a guarantee that the product will perform as advertised. So employers also rely on the reputation of the school and the reputation of its graduates. As I stated earlier, international accreditation and rankings are critical factors that influence how society at large and employers in particular perceive a school's quality and the quality of its graduates. In other words, its reputation. An accreditation by AACSB or EFMD says much about the quality of a school, its faculty and staff, its facilities and its programs. Rankings by, for example, the Financial Times tends to speak for the quality of the graduates because these rankings place much importance on career success or at least on salaries. Just as employers look at the school's reputation, so do prospective students. And this, among other factors, of course, largely determines whether they will want to enroll in a particular school. And thanks to social media, word travels in nanoseconds and spreads rapidly like the Ebola virus, and a school's <laughs> reputation can be enhanced or tarnished just as quickly. In our school, if if our school had all the money in the world, still all we could do is match the competition. If a top school with a global reputation has a modern building, well, if we had all the money in the world, we would build one too. If they had the best teachers, if we had all the money, we would then pirate those teachers or others like them. If they had the best students, we would offer bigger scholarships and so on. But the fact is, we don't have all the money in the world. So we need to innovate. But as we do, we want to ensure that we retain those values that we, as a school, believe to be non-negotiable. Firstly, AIM is a practitioner-orientated school. We are educating professional managers, not academic theoreticians. Secondly, we believe that adult learning is best achieved through active engagement and participation in the learning process. And this is where we encounter great difficulties and challenges. Let's take that first value, practitioner orientation. This essentially means that we put more importance on practice than theory. Since AIM's birth, Faculty recruitment focused on finding experienced managers who could teach, not PhDs who could do research. Our instructors came from industry, not from doctoral programs. Their only academic qualification was typically an MBA, and any research they undertook resulted in cases, not journal articles. I said earlier that an important element of reputation these days is international accreditation. While AIM was one of the first Southeast Asian schools to get accreditation from AACSB, and we have been accredited for more than a decade now, recently we have come under pressure to increase the number of academically qualified AQ instructors. Meaning that, for example, an instructor of a marketing course must have a PhD in marketing obtained within the last five years, or if longer than that, he, should, he or she should have published at least three articles in peer-reviewed journals in the last five years. So we have had to recruit in the last three to five years now, we've had to recruit PhDs and get them teaching and publishing. Publishing has not been a problem for them, but in most cases, teaching has. For one, most doctoral programs do not train their students to teach. For another, many doctoral students have not had substantial work experience, let alone management experience, and this is where they run into problems in the AIM classroom. Students come to AIM because we are practitioner-orientated, 
and we are a case method school. Our students much prefer instructors who can manage a case discussion and who have the requisite industry and management experience to be credible in their eyes. So we have a dilemma because our students prefer the PQ, the professionally qualified instructors, to the AQ, academically qualified instructors, and they have in fact been petitioning the administration to give the AQs fewer teaching sessions. The AQ instructors are causing them, in fact, they say, to be disengaged and less inclined to be participative in our case discussions. Meanwhile, the AACSB is threatening to withdraw our accreditation unless we take positive steps to improve our AQ numbers. But as with most problems, this one presented opportunities for innovation. To be fair, the AACSB review team itself suggested at least a temporary solution. They suggested that since we had, in fact, a good number of AQs in our faculty, what we had to do was distribute them in a way that the instructor of record for each course would be AQ, but this would not prevent PQ instructors from co-teaching with them. Now, carried to extremes, this could have meant that the instructor of record sits in the back of the classroom playing Angry Birds or Candy Crush, while the PQ instructor is in front conducting the uh, class. In practice, we decided to adopt a team teaching structure while at the same time reinventing our MBA core curriculum by merging some courses so we actually have fewer courses, which means we would have relatively more AQ instructors to go around and it also allowed us to integrate related areas. For example, where we had skills-oriented courses like organizational behavior, management communications, business networking, and so on, we merged these into one course that we are calling Enhancing Managerial Competence. As we speak, my colleagues back in Manila are meeting to absorb the quantitative analysis course into the marketing and operations courses. We also had the opportunity to define the roles that different team members would play. For one, each could leverage his or her specific expertise as needed. For example, again in marketing, one might have more experience in FMCG, fast moving consumer goods, while another in advertising and so on. In the past, the marketing instructor would need to be familiar with just about every aspect of marketing, even outside his actual experience as in distribution, sales, promotion, and so on. And to encourage journal publication, we do, believe it or not, actually believe in the importance of such research still, the AQ instructors are mandated to help the PQ instructors validate their real-life experience through empirical research and develop theoretical frameworks therefrom. We have also tried to take advantage of the students' proficiency with the internet and their penchant for using laptops, mobile phones, social media, and so on. For example, we have incorporated more introductory or, or foundational material from Harvard Publishing in Accounting and Financial Analysis. These are online courses uh, which you can get for a price, but they're, they're actually very well done. And we are experimentally also offering our students an elective course based on an online program on business analytics developed and delivered by a startup company of young professionals in Bangalore. This brings me finally to how our students have implicitly challenged our long-held assumptions about the learning process. Our students have been encouraged by what they perceive now as an innovative climate at AIM where professors are more open to their concerns and their situations and their backgrounds. They've taken an interest in promoting, for example, the reputation of the school or helping to enhance the reputation of the school by participating in international business competitions that focus on innovation for the development of social enterprise. And they've been quite successful uh, the last few years uh, in, uh, in winning these competitions and their success has been publicized in the social media. 
In fact, the initiatives taken by our students in recent years has begun to open our eyes in administration and in the faculty to the fact that for too long, our mental model of participative learning has been too constrained by our devotion to the case method. We have put too much emphasis on how well a student is able to analyze and discuss a case. Yet we are seeing far too many students whose discussion skills are not particularly outstanding, yet show their true abilities in activities of their own design. In these so-called extracurricular projects, they are probably learning much more than what we are trying to teach them in the classroom. I have of late come to the conclusion that the biggest challenge facing us is to set aside our mental models, mindsets, and assumptions about learning and move the teacher away from the center of the learning process and put the student in the center instead. We need to work with the student in reinventing the learning environment. This means redefining in our minds and especially in our hearts what is the role of the student today. 37 years ago, when I was a very young junior instructor, we had a visitor from Korea who sat as an observer in my class as I conducted a case discussion. The visitor probably noticed that whenever a student said something, I would take note of his inputs by parsing, summarizing his statement on the blackboard and, uh, and uh, putting these together with uh, inputs from my other students also on the blackboard. Uh, students did much of the talking in, in my class. So when we were having lunch afterwards, the Korean visitor remarked that he found the classroom dynamic really strange, weird. Because, as he put it, in Korea, teacher talk, student write. In AIM, student talk, teacher write. <laughs> and that, I believe, is an observation that more than ever, we must build upon. In today's world, teachers must accept that students have more options than ever before as to where and how and when they will learn what they want to learn. It is incumbent on the teacher to work with the student and together find the best way. Ultimately, therefore, innovation in management education must focus on redefining and reinventing the role of the teacher and invariably the role of the school. I will end with that. I look forward to your reactions and exchanging ideas and experiences with you in the open forum. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.